in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. All right, let's go. If you've got Bibles, we're going to Genesis chapter 2, and we're going to be in verses 18 to 25. And so, yep, we've been going through the book of Genesis, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And believe it or not, um, for quite a while there, word by word. So each week we're studying literally one word at a time, which is making this definitely the longest sermon series um, that any church has ever hosted anywhere on the planet at any time. And no, our research team didn't come up with that. That's a random stat. That's probably not true. Okay. Um, but yeah, here's what we're doing. We're going through the book of Genesis. And we see in Genesis chapter 1, we see the record or the accounting of the creation of the heavens and the earth. And then in chapter 2, Moses takes us into the creation dynamic. And um, what we see in, uh, in the second chapter is we see that um, to a great degree, the earth has been unclaimed and uncultivated. And so we see this need for cultivation uh, within a, 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 a somewhat of a barren earth. So earth does not look like a garden at this time, but with in the earth is a location called Eden. Everyone say Eden. Okay, Eden means paradise. It also, it also means pleasure. Okay, so here on this earth that's somewhat um, unclaimed and uncultivated is a location called Eden, and in Eden is a garden. What we've been studying, this Eden dynamic, is that what God actually created here um, wasn't just a place with a garden unto man, but what he was actually creating was a temple unto himself. And when he creates mankind in his own image and likeness, what he's actually creating, okay, are a priesthood people that will be guardians or watchmen in Eden cultivating, nurturing, protecting this temple dynamic and expanding Eden until the entire earth is one big abiding place. The entire earth would be one big temple with one priesthood people unto Yahweh, Elohim, the one who is worthy of our praise and devotion, that the entire earth would be this incredible place of community, union, worship, that the earth and the heavens would be functioning in one place in one time, and you would not be able to, to, to be able to segregate or separate or isolate what's heaven and what's earth. And we see that, refer, that, that this, this interesting language, when you begin looking at the supernatural dynamics of it, what do you mean supernatural? Well, we know that there's two trees in the garden, okay? There was a tree of life that, that Adam and Eve were invited to eat of, okay? And we believe that they did eat of this, this, this tree of, of, of eternal youth. And, and, but there was another tree in the garden, and it was also, believe it or not, it was a good tree as well, that everything that God created was good. So we don't have the good tree and the bad tree, the life tree and the death tree. No, there's two trees. God said, you can eat of this one, but this tree, okay, you're going to have to trust me. It's good, but it's not for you. How many of you know, if, if any of you have parents, then certainly you know you have examples of things that are good, but not for children, like the Godfather trilogy. No? Just me? Okay. All right. See it out. Don't judge me. All right, here we go. So, <laughs> all right. So, we see that there are two trees. We see this, this garden. Today. We see this super. Now, we do know that, like, the, the tree knowledge of good and evil wasn't an apple tree. 
that Eve did not eat of an apple. No, this was a supernatural tree with supernatural fruit. That if you ate of it, you'd be exposed to a consciousness that was not for the immature. You'd be exposed to conscience, which wasn't needed. You'd be exposed to unneeded discernment. In essence, what God is saying is, you don't need street smarts. Why? You have me. He asked them to not eat it. In the same way, the tree of life wasn't, wasn't a cherry tree. It was a supernatural tree. We see that there were four rivers. There's two rivers that we know of. They're earthly rivers. And there are two other rivers that we have no record of what they were, where they started, and where they went. Two earthly rivers, two heavenly rivers. This two realms, heaven and earth, coming together. A, a tree of, of, of life that, that perhaps resembles that of, of the glory of the Lord resting on a tree, consuming it and not burning it. Maybe similar to the holy ground that where Moses got to hear the voice of the Lord. A tree that is on fire and yet not burning and a voice comes from the tree. And it's almost as if God is saying to Moses, take off your shoes. Why? You're not on earth anymore. You're standing in another realm, you are on holy ground in this place, could it be that for a moment, Moses returned to Eden? And we also see a very interesting dynamic. At the end of the Bible, the same stones that are mentioned in Eden return, these supernatural stones, return with the heavenly Jerusalem coming down to the earth. And that's what I refer to as Eden 2.0. I see, I see this new, and, and we, when Bonnie Shada was here at our conference last week, and she began to break down the breakdowns even more on this topic, declaring that Eden was a originally supposed to be a city. And we see the city of God coming down, the new and perfect Jerusalem coming down with the stones, the worship, and the angels coming down to do what? To merge back into earth as God comes and uh, finally judges Satan and his minions, throwing him into the lake of fire and restoring this thing as we pick up where we left off. Where we find ourselves now is in this apostolic age, in the age of the church, of the ecclesia, the called out ones. Where we find ourselves is in this place where the veil has been removed, the burning sword has been removed. We are no longer separated from a holy God. We see this place where Paul would say, in the beginning, the garden was the temple, but in the present, you are now the temple. And the very holy presence of God is no longer kept at bay by a thick curtain. But now you have full access to God himself because of our high and perfect priest, Christ Jesus, who in no sin became all of your sin. Who he with no shame took on all of our, that he with no guilt took on all of our guilt so that we in our imperfection, any imperfect, in, 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 imperfect people here? So that we in our imperfection could step into spiritually and practically the perfection of Christ Jesus. Amen. And not over time, but in the twinkling immediately by faith, by mere faith, activating this place where my mind doesn't understand it, but I know I stand before my God, holy and blameless, 100% A plus because of Jesus. <laughs> but, okay, so God has been creating, and it's been so good, right? I would say it's been so good. It's been so good. It's been tov. Yeah, that's the Hebrew word, tov. This thing has been tov. Everything that God creates is tov. What does tov mean? If everything God creates, he says, it is good. It's good. I created you. You're good. It's, it's tov. But what's tov? It's not just good. It's beautiful. It's beneficial. And it is functional. Any practical people here? Yeah. 
Here, here's what I know. The, the more practical you are, the less you care about design. You want to know, does it work and is it efficient? But this is the incredible thing about our God is that he stinking nailed it in the area of practicality and efficiency as well as glory and beauty. Our God, okay, is a better designer than Steve Jobs. Yep, 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 yep. God creates all this stuff and he says it is good. It is good. He's creating. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> to my little Adam making I, I do you with my own hands with this clay I hold you in my arms and I breathe up your nose my spirit of life going up in God's Italian or something yeah, he's breathing up into his nose and, and, and Adam the clay the clay becomes alive and Pinocchio becomes a boy and he says Abba Daddy. And God is like, yeah, that dope, that tove. That be tove. Okay, it don't matter. All right, here we go. So that's what brings us to, Gen I'm running off three hours of sleep. It's cool. All right, Genesis 2, 18. All right, check it out. Then the Lord God said, it's not tove. It's DJ in my past life. God says, I created all of this amazing stuff. But there's something here, something that I've done that's not good. What? Nothing sinned here yet. There's, there's no rebellion here yet. And yet there's something in the garden that's not good. This should get our attention. And what does he say? He's looking at his Adam, his boy, and he says, it's not good that man should be alone. And all the ladies said, It's not good that man should be alone. Therefore, I will make for him a helper or a rescuer for him. He says it's not good. What, what he's saying here, it's not that Adam's not beautiful, okay? But he says the completion of Tov, this is actually incomplete because there is a non-functionality within this creation. And we see here that Adam is, we'll see this in a second, he's identifying roles and functions for all these different animals. He's, he's got this mandate, okay, and um, to be fruitful and to multiply, to subdue the earth, okay, to take dominion over it. That's a really big job description. And maybe, maybe Adam thinks he can do it because men usually think that they can do stinking anything. The only problem is if he's the only human creature, okay, he might be able to work the ground and make the temp atmosphere, but how the heck is he going to multiply? And this is where God goes, something's not right here. All these animals are having no problem multiplying. All this vegetation is having no, no problem multiplying. And here's Adam. He's saying, okay, subdue the earth, check, take dominion, check, have babies, and God is looking down. He's saying, he's going to need a helper. He's going to need a rescuer. Now, the problem with the word helper is that a lot of guys are like, heck yeah, I need a lot of help. I don't even know how to, I don't even know how to make a bed. I don't even know how to make a meal. If it wasn't for McDonald's, I'd be dead. I need a helper. Anyone know where I can get a helper? What's the name of that app again called? Helper.com, right? I don't even care. You know, she, you know, in Seattle, she don't even have to be a female. I just need a, I just need a helper. Good times. So, now here's the, here's the problem. Here's the problem. When we think of the word helper, as in the English here, we think of like, I, what I need is a servant. What Adam needed was a servant, okay? What Adam needed, not a slave, because that, that's, that's cruel. What, what Adam needed was a servant. He needed a helper. He needed, he needed a maid. And there's this, I, <laughs> don't, don't throw nothing at me. I'm not saying that. But, but sometimes people see the word helper, and they, they, they think that this means a subservient one. 
The problem is that in the Hebrew, this word is used for Yahweh Elohim in relationship to his position in serving the Israelites. God positions himself as Israel's helper. Even the Holy Spirit takes on the job title or the name. The Holy Spirit takes on the name of helper. What Adam needed and what he wasn't going to get was a servant. Husbands, your wife is not your slave. You are to treat your wife in the same way that you would treat the precious Holy Spirit, the paraclete. You are to treat your wife the way that you would honor the very Ruach and the breath of God. Your wife is not there to amuse you. Your wife is not there to gratify you. Your wife is not a robot. Your wife is not... Another beer, sir? That is not what your wife has been called to do. <laughs> this word means partner. This word means a partner like a business partner. Meaning, I'm sorry you don't get to make that decision on your own. Why? Because this business does not belong to you. You're in this with me. And you're going to be better for it. And the business is going to be better for it. And the kingdom is going to be better for it. Adam, I know you think you can do all of this without me. I know you think you got this covered. But God himself said, you need me. We see here that not only does it mean partner, but it actually refers to a counter partner or an opposite partner. How do you know that opposites attract? Which is why oftentimes people with a pastoral gifting, moi, are married to somebody with a prophet gifting, booyah. <laughs> booyah kasha. And what happens? I become far more profit in my composition and sequencing, and my bride becomes far more pastoral in her processing. And what happens there? We come together as one flesh to give a fuller picture of who Jesus is on the earth, the body of Christ. So it's a counter partner. It is, it is this place of a lot of friction, a lot of Perhaps passionate discussion. And the tohu vavohu does not mean that you married the wrong person. The tohu vavohu is the ingredients that God is going to create something beautiful. So you don't give up on the helper that God has created for you because they are so different from you. But you embrace the differences knowing that this is God's grace that he has given to you, not for your happiness, but for your holiness. We ain't fighting. We're just making each other sharper. And that explains the sparks. <laughs> Verse 19. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens, and he brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. And the man gave names to all the livestock, to all the birds, to all the heavens, to every beast of, of the field. Okay, but for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So here's Adam, and this is a beautiful picture, that God actually gives Adam naming rights over these categories and species of all of creation. Here is Yahweh Elohim, mighty God, partnering and collaborating in the business together that God, we've got theology that says that God would come and go from the garden. And every now and then he would show up to check up on Adam. 
And we just get that because of in the cool of the day that God is walking through the garden. But it's not that, it's not that God would go do his day job and then kind of check up. You know, God would go to heaven and every now and then come to the earth and check, check up. No, God was in his home. Adam was in his home. They were in this place of a body. And together within union, God says, I've got a job for you to do. This is part of your assignment to bring identity, okay, to all of creation. And I am going to celebrate the identity that you ascribe to the earth. By the way, if you're a believer, this earth, it's your problem. Okay, different week. All right, so anyways, um, this is funny. So here's, here's Adam, and here comes an antelope. Well, here's Adam, and here comes a giraffe. Okay. And, Nah, right, and, um, and Adam's like, are you all right? <laughs> well, I will call you giraffe, right? All right and, and, and these creatures, you know, these raptor, you know, rah, you know, <laughs> and he's like, you will be velocivosaurus, velocivosaurus, raptor. Okay, so all these creatures are coming to Adam, and this is what Father, the, the, and, and Adam and Yahweh both recognize something, that none of these creatures are really going to be that great of a support to Adam. It's going to be definitely not good if Adam tries to multiply with any of these things. Probably didn't need to be said. So anyways, this is what God says. He says, I will make a suitable helper for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of the ribs and he closed it up in the place of flesh. And that rib that the Lord God had taken from him, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. Now, how many of you have been taught that what God did is that he, he reached into Adam, he took out a rib, okay, and with that bone, he created woman. How many of you, that, that's what it says, and that's what you read, okay, okay, and that's why the aid of an apple tree and a talking snake loses its legs as part of the curse, okay, all Sunday school Genesis, okay. The problem with this is that this word for rib, this is the only place in the entire Bible where this word is used in context with bone. This, you, this word is usually referred to not anything to do with the human body, but referring to the side or half of a building or room. Now, I want you to picture this room that you're sitting in as a dom. What we see here is that God comes to a dom and removes a half of him. Now, this is what it says here. It says that God had taken the rib, the half from Adam, and then from that, he made it into a woman. Everyone say, made. What's interesting about this Hebrew word for made is that it is a word referring to construction that, again, has nothing to do with anatomy or the human body. So what do you, in fact, this is incredible. This word for made is referring to not just construction, but the construction of a wall, the construction of a city, the construction of a watchtower, or, yep, you guessed it, the construction of a temple. So, Pastor Darren, what are you saying? I have no idea. There's like so much mystery here. But all I know is that God did not just come and take a piece of bone. Whatever the makeup and composition of Adam was, we really don't really have any idea of what Adam actually looked like or functioned like. All we know is that God came and took half of him. And then with that half, had a new build construction project in which he built a temple. And when he brought this temple to Adam, now we have a suitable situation in a, temples within a temple where mighty God can be glorified and his species can do what he has called them to do, which is to take dominion of the earth, to make earth flourish, 
and to turn it into this abiding place between heaven and earth as one, which is interesting. That's what Jesus prayed. When Jesus said, pray this way, that his kingdom would come, that his will be done on earth as it is in heaven, what's he talking about? He's talking about Eden. He's saying, pray this way, that it would be now as it was then. What is he doing? Jesus is looking back, maybe. What else is he doing? He's looking forward into the future and the restoration of all things. Stuff's broken right now, you guys. Stuff's broken right now. And some of you think that God's going to fix it in the end. Nope. It's going to get fixed. Every, this whole thing's going to get repaired. There will be a day when every person has a home. But God's not going to fix it. Who's going to fix it? We are. The royal family. Mighty Elohim and his priesthood. <laughs> we are family. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, are we? <laughs> Come on, this is my favorite part. I, I saved the best for last. Why didn't Moses did this for us today? Thank you, Moses. You're welcome. This is what he said. Verse twenty-three. God brings e Eve, and He brings them to Adam, and He begins to wake up. This is my favorite part. Remember, He's been giraffe, raptor, hippopotamus. He brings a monkey, and he names him George, right? And like, like, there's just like, you know, and Adam's got a big yellow hat. It, they, like, like, he's doing this, and, and he, then he falls asleep. All this naming animals, this has been a lot of work. And Adam begins to wake up. And when he opens his eyes, and se instead of seeing Abba, who does he see? A naked woman. Which for the guys is pretty cool, right? All right. And what does Adam do? He begins singing. This is the first song recorded in the Bible when Adam brings, when God brings the naked woman to the man, we have the creation of la 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 la. He goes, this at last is the bone of my bone and the flesh of my flesh. Now look at here. He doesn't just say bone of my bone because more was removed from him than just his bone. Half of him was removed. So when you read it, that God removed a rib, then why is he saying, this isn't just my bone that was... He says, we share the same bone. We share the same flesh. He's saying, when I look at you, I see me. And this is a testimony that we are compatible. This last is the bone of my bone and the flesh of my flesh. And she will be called, right? So he's been naming everything. So he's like, now I'm going to name you, baby. <laughs> and what does he say? And she will be called. Whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa, man. Come here, baby. You're not allowed to talk that way. We're at church. Yeah, but you read books about it. <laughs> you watch movies with it. It's not God glorified. Come on. This is God glorified. This is, this is the stuff, man. This is the stuff. And we see here, uh, and it says, verse 24, let's keep reading. Therefore, look at this. A man shall leave his father and his mother and do what? Hold fast to his wife. And they shall become, everyone they say, and they shall become one flesh. How I many know that that happens in an instant, but there's also the word, and they shall become, which means that it's also a process. How do you know that the kingdom of God is at hand, and yet it's coming? It's a paradox. You feel that, don't you? You feel that tension. Well, God just healed this person, but for some reason this person didn't get healed. The kingdom of God is at hand, and yet there is more to come. And we see this dynamic within marriage, and they shall become, listen, don't you dare get married unless you're going to be committed to the process of becoming one. Becoming one. 
And that means one in every category. Yep, one flesh, one mind, one passion, one home, unified in your values, unified in your adoration and commitment to Jesus, unified in aspects perhaps of your theology with subtle variances perhaps, unified with your bank account. Well, she pays the mortgage and I pay the cable bill. Well, that's fair. I mean, I'm sure you got HBO, but that's not fair. Unified. We are, that, that we're not going to practice serial marriage. Why? Because we're something called a Christian, which means that we are in this together forever, period. End of the story. But why does it say that the man would leave his father and his mother? Shouldn't the woman leave her father and mother? What's interesting about this is that within Jewish culture, within the Israeli culture, that um, the woman would actually remain with her mother and her father. And that even after marriage, the, the, the woman would continue to live with mom and dad. Their marriage would be consummated in the home of mom and dad, which is weird. Hope they went out to eat at least for a little while. Came back. And from time to time, I'm just having way too much fun with this text. From time to time, the husband would not live there. The husband would come back to visit his wife. At the appropriate time, they would move out together, and this would be a marriage process. According to the Israeli culture, marriage was a process. And that's why it says here that it's the man that goes on the journey. Follow me here. It's the man that goes on the journey of becoming a man, and it's not just sexual. A lot of people think that the, the journey of a, of a boy into a man is this thing, and it's driven by a biological urge of sexuality to find a partner to procreate with. But no, 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 no. It's much, much, much deeper than that. And we see this term used in our stream as a bloodline we hear the term bloodline. But what we actually see here is what scholars call a flesh line connection. And what we see here is that within the heart of every young man, there's a subconscious record that says, young boy, a half of your room has been removed from you. And every young boy goes on a journey to find what has been removed from him. His other half. And it is the role of dads and moms to prepare their young men for this glorious journey to rescue their bride, to fight for their bride, to not be like the world says, a young man, a predator on the prowl out at night looking to woo someone, looking to manipulate a young gal. No, as, as Christian parents, we raise up our sons not to think like predators, but to think like rescuers, to think like priests, to think like watchmen. And yet, and yet we recognize as parents that there's a part of our, our boy's heart that has been removed. A half of him is not there, and that God has created for our sons a temple. A, a woman that would not be taken advantage of, but a woman that would come alongside of to help rule and reign. And the same way we teach our daughters that they are temples and they are beautiful and they are holy and they should never share themselves with another boy. But when the time comes, they will give of themselves and, and daddy will give them over in this uh, a covenant union and covenant marriage, which is a tradition of the church. And the government has no business conducting marriages because the government doesn't give a damn about marriage. The government only cares about money and power. And it is time that the church of Jesus Christ realize that marriage is holy and the only people that have any business to conduct a marriage is a priest who values marriage enough to counsel the couple and to prepare them for holy war. For holy war. 
that we have no business sending out our young people just to flippantly get married without the kind of preparation that doesn't just happen from a pastor, but it happens from a mother and a father. who. Pre- it is not my job to prepare your children to be married. It is your job to prepare your children to be married. It is your job. It is not the job of James Dobson to prepare. And we see the divorce statistics are the same in the church as they are in the world because we have drank the wine and the foolishness of the world. We've taken on worldly cosmic programming. And we don't know the difference between the holy and the profane. And we play the same games as the world. And that we judge. We have the audacity to judge a young couple when they go through a divorce. We have the audacity to judge them when we did nothing to prepare them and to help them. Because we don't think like a family and we don't think like a body. We are selfish and we only think about ourselves. When was the last time you bought a devotional for a young couple? When was the last time you took a young married bride and you said, how is your marriage? How is your sex life? How are you struggling? You better have a relationship before you ask that question. When was the last time that as a man, you took a young man under your arm and said, how are you doing? How are things going? When was the last fight you had with your bride and who won? This is the job of the church, of the body of Jesus Christ, to say this is our responsibility, that we can lower the divorce statistics and we'll stop playing religious games and we get back to the word of God that says every young man... Every young man will go on a journey to find the part of him that was removed. And every young woman will wait for her rescuer to come. Every young woman will wait for her hero to come. To woo her and to pursue her and to tell her, I will treat you with dignity. I will treat you with value. You are worth fighting for. As to engage in the violent, passionate process of becoming one flesh. And don't think for a second that is just about sexuality and multiplication and reproduction. Paul says it has everything to do with this prophetic drama of the reality of Christ and the church and the two Two becoming one. God created marriage. He created marriage to communicate something in the natural that in the same way that the two pledge their devotion, their allegiance together, that in the same way we can always count on our bridegroom that no matter how unfaithful we are, his arms will always be open wide to us. And no matter how unfaithful we are, he will always be ready to receive us back as his bride. He will always be there to wash us in his oil and to wash us in his water. That our great bridegroom, that we are the bride. You read Song of Solomon. And you, and you see the bridegroom with a part of his heart that's been missing. And you see the pursuit as he's jumping over mountains and flying through the trees. As he's pursuing his, his bride. You, you feel the incompleteness in the bridegroom. You feel the incompleteness that he's, 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 a part of him is gone. And yet he's so passionately in love with his bride as he woos her. And as he welcomes her. And as he has prepared a place for her. All a mystery of the relationship of mighty God. Elohim and the mystery of this union and covenant with his glorious church. In verse 25, and the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. And on one hand, what you see here is two so connected in a place of union, in a place of covenant, in a place of joy, in a place of pleasure, that they are fully together and there is nothing that can divide them. In a few weeks, we're going to look that things change. And the very first thing that happens when they sin against God is there is division in their marriage. The very first thing that sin comes to do is to divide a husband's heart from the heart of his wife. And then the second division we see is the relationship between mankind and Father God. The enemy comes to divide and then to divide again. Destructive division. It says, and they were naked and they felt no shame. There we think of nakedness perhaps as a 
construct of the soul, this place of oneness, this place of union. But I want to remind you guys of something. Adam and Eve had not yet eaten of the fruit. Therefore, they were what? They were still childlike. And what we see is a picture of two children playing in a bathtub together, and there's nothing wrong with it. Why? They're just children. They're just children. There's no concept of nakedness. There's no concept of anything being wrong. What we see are two children in the garden, in this place of figuring out who they are, figuring out who God is, and figuring out how they're going to do this together. This is where God's taken us. He's taken us back so that we can get to the future. And all of a sudden we realize that the grace of God doesn't ex exist just to forgive us of our sin. The grace of God exists to empower us to return back to this Eden place. Let me tell you something. It is possible for you to be with your husband, for you to be with your wife, and to fully be one. One mind, one thought, one passion, one heart, one devotion be before God. Radically different. Radically opposite. And that's why there's no such thing as gender fluidity. Fluidity. That's why there's no such thing, okay, as a man that can pretend to be a woman and swim and win, a, and win some great award. There is an attack right now, not against people's rights, but against the definition of what is a man and what is a woman. Why? Because the culture is trying to say it don't matter. It's whatever makes you happy. It's whatever affirms you. But truth matters. And the reason why truth matters is because it's not about what makes you happy. It's about the reality that you are a room that's been divided and that God has created for you a helper, a co-leader, a partner, and they are the opposite sex from you. And you might have same-sex attraction. Listen, God, people are here in this church. They are attracted to people of the same sex. Yet they know they are loved by God and they are going through the process of having the scratches in the record healed. They're going through the process of confronting their trauma. They're going through the process of saying, I have a lot of emotions and feelings and even sexual urges, okay, that want to define who I am. But I will not let these urges define who I am because I know there's a blueprint that is beautiful. And I won't try to make the blueprint change for who I am. I am willing for Holy Spirit to transform me so that I can work with his blueprint. So shame off you right now in Jesus' name. <laughs> You're like, Pastor Darren, you don't even know what I was looking at last night on the internet. No, and I don't want to know. But I know that's not his temple that he has for you. That's a temple that's being exploited. And that you are not to be a predator. You're to be a rescuer. A mighty man. A mighty woman. Righteous and holy. Not because of your good works. But because of the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, I'm hungry. A little sleepy. So let us stand together. Let's, as my wife says, let's wrap it up. Thanks for, hanging in this, thanks for hanging in there with me. This was a long one. But it's one of the most important studies that we can do together as a church. Discovering God's origin plan for sexuality. Just to clarify with me right now. It is good. Put out your hands. I'll bless you. Father, thank you for every person in this room. I thank you for your plan and purpose that you have for each and every per person in this room. I thank you that we are not the sum of the decisions that we have made in the past, but we are who you say we are. That we are royal, righteous, 
and victorious because of the finished work of the cross. Now, anyone looking around, I'll tell you something. Good people don't go to heaven. Nope. Forgiven people go to heaven. And we are all in need of forgiveness. We have all screwed up. We've all done some dumb, dumb stuff. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. The Bible says that whosoever believes in the Lord, okay, would be saved. And you're a whosoever, so am I. The Bible says if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth, he'll be faithful and just to forgive you of all your sins. I got good news. The devil lied to you. God loves you so much, and so do we as a church. I don't care what you've done. I'm really excited about what you're going to do. Can we all just pray together right now? Just de declare with me right now. Jesus, I believe in my heart. I confess with my mouth that you are God, that you became flesh, that you died on a cross for all my sins, that you didn't die for me. You died as me. I confess I have sinned against you. I ask that you would forgive me of all my sins. By faith I declare, I am forgiven now, and I'm being given a second chance. If you prayed that prayer with me today, I want to welcome you to the family of God. You're my brother, you're my sister, and I am proud of you. If you're watching online, you're my brother, you're my sister, and I am proud of you. Listen, next time you screw up, I'm not trying to prophesy, but next time you screw up, don't run away from God like you did last time. Run to Him. Because His arms will always be open. He is the faithful bridegroom. And He will always, He will always, He will always keep His arms wide for you. If you need prayer for anything, you don't have to leave. I'm going to have our prayer ministry team come. If they are going to uh, be up here. If you need prayer, encouragement, physical healing, maybe you need deliverance from demonic torment, nightmares, night terrors. Listen, God is here. He will touch you. He will radically set you free. Um, otherwise, have an amazing week. We will be back tonight. We are going to be studying the Apostle Barnabas and the very first martyr in church history, which was the Deacon Stephen. That's part of our Interrupter series, 6 o'clock. Otherwise, you are radically loved by God. Proud of you guys. Bless you.